Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Holly Peterson. Good evening. Last year, we welcomed Cardinal Timothy Dolan and Father Richard Veras for this first annual series on the life and thought of Monsignor Luigi Giussani, founder of the Ecclesial Movement, Communion and Liberation. Tonight's gathering is an occasion to delve more deeply into the contents of a fundamental concept of Christianity, the encounter, as understood and taught by Father Luigi Giussani and described in this book, Generating Traces, which happens to be for sale in the foyer on your way out. Born in 1922 in Desio, Italy, Giussani described his childhood as poor in bread and rich in music. He began the path of his priestly vocation at the tender age of 10, and those formative years were filled with encounters that marked his life. He wrote, if I had not met Monsignor Gaetano Corti in high school or had Monsignor Colombo's literature class, Christ would have been just a word or a theological musing. Giussani himself described the event of the encounter with Monsignor Corti. Everything came like the surprise of a beautiful day when a teacher in my first year of high school, I was 15 years old, read and explained the first pages of John's Gospel. He told us, the word of God, in other words, that for which all things were made, became flesh. And so beauty became flesh. Goodness became flesh. Justice became flesh. Love, life, and truth became flesh. Being was not in the realm of ideas. It became flesh, and it was alive among us. Corti and a few others shaped Giussani's understanding of the encounter with Christ. It meant to bump into a fact, to a person, who, like a beautiful day, marked you for your entire life. Just as it happened with John and Andrew when they met Jesus Christ. Giussani began a path, a journey in faith and endure, that endured his entire life, as then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger noted at his funeral mass. He said, Father Giussani always kept the eyes of his life and his heart fixed on Christ. In this way, he understood that Christianity was not an intellectual scheme, a pack of dogmas, or a moralism. Christianity is rather an encounter, a love story, an event. This love affair with Christ, this love story, which was the whole of his life, was far from superficial enthusiasm. Following Christ is following the path. It is making the journey. Nine years after Giussani's ordination to the priesthood, following the signs that God gave him, he left a promising career in academia to work in the prestigious Berchet Public High School in Milano. In his classes, he spoke of the centrality of Christ to all of life, all the while challenging his students to verify for themselves that what he said was true for their own lives. His methodology was dynamic, sometimes unorthodox as recently was discovered in a dialogue, a dialogue among some of his former students. He pulled us in, in a completely unique way, for a priest that is. For example, a soccer tournament, hikes in the mountains, or taking us to do charitable work. In that period of my life, I learned the value of poverty and solidarity, which has been with me ever since those years. Giussani used the poetry of his beloved Giacomo Leopardi with such vibrancy that one student remembered. When he explained those words, he left us mesmerized, cut us to the core. He penetrated our hearts. Yes, said another student, it was evident that that man wanted something from us. That man wanted our hearts. And what was it that this unorthodox priest did in the classroom? Giussani discussed everything with his students, studies, politics, friendship, culture, life, and love. And in doing so, he became, what, he became for them what Monsignor Corti was for him, 
an encounter with a presence who witnessed an audacity in his relationship with Jesus Christ present here and now. But he also taught them a method to verify everything that they heard, challenging them to compare everything that they were told and what they experienced with the deepest desires of their hearts. In this way, he conquered us, said the former mayor of Milan. You could agree or disagree with him, but his class was one in which you were there blown away by what you heard. You had to decide. Around Jasani, a movement was born, a movement of young people in 1945 began what is today known as communion and liberation. Today, CL spans 80 countries and continues to educate both young and old, including a once archbishop from Buenos Aires, Jorge Mario Borgoglio, who said in 1998, for many years now, Jasani's writings have inspired me to reflect and have helped me to pray. They have taught me to be a better Christian. Monsignor Giussani is one of those unexpected gifts the Lord has given the church after the Vatican Council. The future Pope Francis, along with future Pope Francis and countless other individuals, despite never having met Father Giussani, attribute much of their encounter to meeting one, of, one or another of his spiritual sons and daughters. He was a dear friend to people who held a wide spe spectrum of cultural and religious beliefs, a companion on the journey for those seeking to live life fully, because in him they found a credible witness of intelligence, joy, and holiness. Giussani died in 2005 at the age of 82, having a rich life as priest, thinker, and educator, able to speak about Christ to modern men and women. On February 22, 2012, his cause of beatification and canonization was opened, and today he is referred to as Servant of God Luigi Giussani. Cardinal Archbishop Angelo Scuola described Giussani thus, He is the Don Bosco of our time, a genius in the educational sphere, and I'm confident that one day he'll be known as a father of the church in the noblest sense of the word. I learned from Giussani a respect, a passion, and a love for the great body of the church, because in him I found a free man. Tonight we will delve into a particular accent of this man's charism and an essential aspect of Christianity, the event of an encounter. To help us along our journey, we have two exceptional speakers once again. We have Dr. Mikael Waldstein, a renowned theologian and author, and Father Solanus Benfatti, a Franciscan friar of the Renewal, the scholar of life of St. Francis. Both gentlemen, who I will call great friends, have, imp have impressive biographies, which you will find in your program. Before I introduce our guests, let us take one more glimpse at Giussani's life. The fundamental question for the human person, for any person, in any time until the end of history, ever since the message that God became man, was brought, entered the world, the greatest question of life is this. No greater question is conceivable. That is, the human person cannot imagine a greater question for his freedom. Christ, yes or no. Luigi Giussani was born on October 15, 1922, in the town of Desio, in the Lombardy region of Italy. His father, Beniamino, was an artisan with sympathies for the socialist cause, who passed on to his son a thirst for justice and a passion for reason. From his mother, Angelina, young Luigi received the gift of a deep-seated and well-educated Catholic faith. His love for learning and culture were evident when Luigi entered the seminary at the age of 10. Years later, following his ordination, Father Giussani was assigned to teach theology, but a chance meeting with a group of young people marked a new course in his life. This encounter convinced him that the experience of Christian faith was becoming detached from the experience of daily life and was reaching a crisis point. 
And then I left to devote myself through teaching religion in public schools to the attempt to communicate religion in a way that would be more easily acceptable to young people. Going up the steps of Berche High School, I asked myself, what am I coming here to do? I come here to give these kids the opportunity to know what I have known, because why should I have known and felt the reasons and them not? Then freedom will show the road ahead as it wills. The Lord says, whoever follows me will have eternal life and a hundredfold year below. And I used to say in class, if you do not desire eternal life, I understand you because you don't have much imagination. But if you do not desire the hundredfold year below, then you are fools. Though Jasani hadn't planned to start a new church movement, he understood that his charism truly was a continuation of Christ's presence in history and was thus an answer to contemporary humanity's desire for truth, beauty, justice, and happiness. We, like everyone else, want a better humanity. But it is not possible for humanity to love better by itself. Alone, with only its projects, its fantasies, and its energies. This is what we want to say with the term communion and liberation. It is only the communion that God made possible himself through Christ. It is only in the communion among men who recognize this, that in expanding itself creates oases of truer humanity. Father Giussani was filled with wonder as he saw communion and liberation communities spring up across the globe, generating new cultural initiatives and charitable works. CL can now be found in more than 90 countries on every inhabited continent. As the movement grew and matured, Jasani continued to remind its members that their primary task was to acknowledge and announce the fact of God's saving mercy made present in Christ. The mystery is mercy remains the last word, even on all the awful possibilities of history. For this reason, existence expresses itself as ultimate ideal in begging. The real protagonist of history is the beggar. Christ who begs for man's heart, and man's heart that begs for Christ. Father Giussani died in February 2005, just days before the passing of his dear friend, Pope John Paul II. At Giussani's funeral, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger captured the essence of this humble Milanese priest whose passion for Christ had impacted so many. Father Giussani was touched, or better, wounded, by the desire for beauty. He was not satisfied, however, with just any ordinary beauty, with beauty, however banal. He sought, rather, beauty itself infinite beauty and thus he found Christ family in Arizona, they have a daughter, she 
got to get to know her. She is going to be going to the same college and apparently they wrote also for her about me and I remember when I got there to Los Angeles to the college looking around is that she is that she is that she but it turned out to be in each case mistaken there was a party the evening before the first class fantastic party uh, a family with very talented children, uh, 16 of them, who had a choir and they sang Renaissance madrigals that evening, fantastic. And at a certain point, a young woman came across the room and I knew it was she. And I think the reason I knew it was she is she heard me speak German, so she knew that it was I, and I saw in her eyes that she knew it was me. That was an encounter. It was an event. Those are the words I want to focus on, encounter and event. A lot came from that encounter, from that event. At Thomas Aquinas College, there's the habit of having Kris Kringle. During Advent, you draw, at the beginning of Advent, you draw a name out of a hat. And then for that person, you do things during Advent, which as an expression of love. And then at Christmas, this is a secret, at Christmas you reveal yourself. And there's a bigger present then. I was standing next to somebody drawing names out of the hat and I saw that he drew her name and he saw that I drew the name of the girl he was interested in <laughs> and it was a matter of a moment for the two pieces of paper to change hands. <laughs> so um, my wife found out about this only years later. She thought it was divine providence, but uh, it was her hus husband's connivance. Now we have eight children. So an event led by and by to tremendous consequences. A couple of years after we got married, we moved to Rome. To for me to study at the Biblicum in 1981. That's when I met Father Giussani for the first time. Though the real impression came a few years later, but already the first impression was similar in its impact and its force. I'll talk more about that. He seemed to me free like a bird. The man was free like a bird. Uh, the most natural man. Being with him was being at peace. There was no project. He wasn't being enlisted in anything. He was being taken for who I am and loved. He wanted me to be happy, that was clear. Encounter is a very strange word when you think about it. It comes from the two Latin words in or into and contra. So there's the idea of in and against. Apparently one of the first examples of it is in Gibbons. The two kings encountered each other in single combat. It's not exactly what happened at that party with, with um, Susan. But from the idea of a hostile clash, the word encounter then began to be extended to more positive meanings. But it's always a significant event, an event that contains a promise in it. 
in Shakespeare, for example, there are fantastic passages about encountering. In Romeo and Juliet, right after they exchange their marriage vows, Romeo says to Juliet, Ah, uh, Juliet, if the measure of thy joy be heaped like mine, let rich music's tongue unfold the imagined happiness that both receive in either by this dear encounter. It is an event and contained in it an imagined, at this point, imagined happiness. Of course, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. Juliet's response is beautiful because it confirms exactly that note of promise. Conceit, that is imagination again, conceit more rich in matter than in word. They are but beggars that can count their worth. But my true love is grown to such excess I cannot sum up half my sum of wealth. In The Tempest, you find a similar scene where Prospero arranges the marriage between Miranda, his daughter, and Ferdinand. And he looks at their first meeting, at their first encounter. And aside, he says, fair encounter of two most rare affections, heavens rain grace on that which breeds between them. And then right after that, aside by Prospero, Ferdinand notices that Miranda has tears wondering why, why? Wherefore weep ye, he says. And then Miranda says, and that again brings out the point of the word encounter. At my unworthiness, that these rhymes I love, they're, they're fantastic, they're, they're worth memorizing. That dare not offer what I desire to give, and much less take what I shall die to want. So you have the intensity of desire, a sense of a great wealth hidden behind the sign to come, a sense of unworthiness of entering into it immediately. Right at the beginning of Deus Caritas Est, Pope Benedict writes the following thing. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice, of a lofty idea. You can have family values as much as you want. If you don't have a spouse, you won't be married. The spouse is the really important thing about marriage. It's the best thing about marriage. It's what makes it worthwhile. It's when you have a spouse that it makes sense for you to behave in a certain way. Moral rules in the abstract are difficult. Being Christian is not the idea, is not the result of an ethical choice or of a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event with an event, with a person which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Pope Francis, early on, gave an interview. And unfortunately, many of us Americans were quite critical of him there, but there's a beautiful thing he says in there. 
we cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraceptive methods, because all of these are questions of ethics. I have not spoken much about these things, and I was reprimanded for that. I'm still reprimanded, and many of us reprimanded for that. But when we speak about these issues, we have to talk about them in a context. This is also what fascinates and attracts more, what makes the heart burn as it did for the disciples at Emmaus. Otherwise, even the moral edifice of the church is likely to fall like a house of cards, losing the freshness and fragrance of the gospel. The freshness and fragrance of the gospel. The proposal of the gospel must be more simple, profound, radiant, it's from this position that the moral consequences then flow. The proclamation of the saving love of God comes before moral and religious imperative. It is encountered as absolutely first. Complete agreement between Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul and Pope Francis on this, on this matter. When you recognize an event that happens to you as an encounter, so it's because of a promise it contains. Looking back, when I first saw Susie, I was amazed. There was, it was a sign of things to come. I didn't know exactly what was coming, but. You realize that it was an encounter by remaining faithful to it. There's a passage in Aristotle, which is fantastic in this way. He uses a word that children know extremely well. En oikeo, that is to live inside a house, be at home. That's a word that's very close to a word in the Gospel of John. That's the word meno, to remain. This is what Aristotle says. Lack of experience makes us less able to see the recognized facts together as a whole. For this reason, those who have dwelled more among natural things, That's literally if you take the Greek there, have dwelt more in the house with natural things, experience remaining with them, are better able to grasp beginnings that can speak about many facts together as a whole, while those whom many words have kept from looking at the existing things are quick to proclaim their opinions by looking at a few things. Riro this morning told me a quip which seemed to me very apt. The word became flesh. Theologians have made many words out of the flesh. So living in the same house with natural things, that's the way to gather experience about them. That's the way to realize that an encounter was an encounter, that its content was really rich. It's the only way to avoid sentimentality that makes meetings that are promising and thrilling disappear in the stream of experience like a YouTube clip. It passes by and leaves no trace. 
So how can an encounter unfold its promise? How can one verify the encounter? Or how can one verify the event as an encounter and reach a firm judgment? Yeah, well, in Oikeo, you have to stay, live with, to remain. That's the point of departure of Giussani in the first chapter of the book. That's the basis of our evening. He talks about the first two disciples in the Gospel of John, one of whom is probably John himself. They meet Jesus for the first time. And in that passage, the word remain, meno, seems to have a very superficial sense. It doesn't seem to mean terribly much. This is what the text says. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, look, the Lamb of God. Very mysterious short. The two learners, disciples, heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, and then John translates it into Greek, which means teacher, where are you remaining? He uses that same word, meno. He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was remaining, and they remained with him that day. It was about the 10th hour. What seems to have triggered the encounter in this case are the mysterious words of John the Baptist, this is the Lamb of God. They're very mysterious words, but you have to take them as relating to the deep hopes of Israel. The lamb as the sacrificial animal par excellence and sacrifice as a way of reaching out toward God, reaching God reaching out toward us, of reaching union and reconciliation. And it's exactly the density of that formulation that's so effective. It's mysterious. The learners, the disciples, they perceive an implicit fullness in a dense and finite sign. It was like seeing a woman walk across the room. It's a very finite, it's a very limited sign. Then Jesus takes this desire of the two men as the starting point. The desire to, what is this? What's behind it? He turns to them with what may seem a surprising question. What are you seeking? So he pinpoints the desire in their hearts. The inner energy is stirred up in them by this mysterious sign given by their teacher about the Lamb of God. That desire is the first thing Jesus turns to. It is what makes an encounter possible. Without desire, no encounter. Here, a passage from the book of Giussani. Our heart has an ultimate, imperious, deep-set need for fulfillment, for truth, beauty, goodness, love, final certitude and happiness. So to come across an answer to these needs should be the most obvious and normal thing. Yet on the contrary, this correspondence, which should be supremely normal, becomes supremely exceptional for us. 
to come face to face with something absolutely and profoundly natural. That is to say, something that corresponds to the needs of the heart that nature gives us is therefore something absolutely exceptional. It often happens that a man meets a woman. It corresponds deeply to the desires of the heart. It happens often, but it's exceptional. When Jesus asks, what are you seeking? So he pinpoints their desire. That desire was very much awake in me looking at Susie for the first time. They don't ask, well, what did John the Baptist mean by saying this is the Lamb of God? What, what exactly is meant by that? All they say is, well, where's the place where you're remaining? We want to be with you. If you read the whole Gospel of John, you know that the place in which the Son remains is the mystery par excellence. It's the mystery of the Father. And so this question opens up an abyss of mystery. In chapter 14, Jesus says, In my Father's house, there are many places to remain in. Same word. If not, would I have told you that I'm going in order to pre prepare a place for you? I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Jesus simply invites them to come and see. And they say they stayed with him that day. They remained with him that day. And John says, it was about the 10th hour. He has the exact detail in his mind. That evening when I met Susie, her steps across the carpet, I can remember the details of it. Now, they would have maybe disappeared had a history not happened after it that grew out of it. But because a history grew out of it, I recognize it in retrospect as an encounter. People often talk about, well, it's silly to talk about love at first sight. And, and in a way that's true, uh, because love is something built over time. But it's deeply true if you look back and you recognize the moment as the seed from which something really great sprang. Like recognizing an oak tree in an acorn. An acorn is not an oak tree, that's, that's for sure has all the power of the oak tree in it. So the encounter begins with particular circumstances, at a particular time, a particular place, about the 10th hour. And those circumstances may seem poor. What they require is a journey of verification. And in that verification, a judgment must be made if the encounter really was one, whether it's worth pursuing, whether a real goal, a real good lies in it. Without that work of verification and without continuous openness to the newness of encounter, the original impact would suffocate in its finiteness.
the depth to which these things can go, Jesus indicates them in the Eucharistic discourse. He says there, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. The word remain has taken on a lot more force than in the first occurrence. Where are you remaining? And they remained with him that day. Now it's deepened. So they've come a long way. They're invited to enter the depth and interior of the initial encounter. That's what's meant by do this in memory of me. So what Giussani called the group of those who live a consecrated life, memores domini, those who remember the Lord, rememberers of the Lord. Do this in memory of me. The first time John uses the word remain, he talks about remain with. In the Eucharistic discourse, he talks about remaining in. That's a step forward. Remaining with, could be kind of side by side, remaining in shows much more interiority. So through the Eucharist, the one with whom the learners remained achieves what only this particular rabbi can achieve, namely that one can enter his depth, remain in him, and he remains in oneself. Augustine has this fantastic phrase in the Confessions that God is more inside than what is most inside me. Because God is the source from which I spring more inside than what is most inside. That's the level they reach. In chapter 15, there's an important passage that adds some aspects that Giussani draws out. Jesus says there, as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Notice, this is an announcement of, of a fact. This is stating a fact. It's not making a demand. It's stating a fact. But then comes the moral consequence. R remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. The commandments do come along, but they come along in second place. It's very important that they come along in second place. If they come along in first place, what is it that you perceive religion as? As a limit on your freedom. Or perhaps as a guidance, but still an arduous guidance. But in the first place, it's an encounter with something fascinating that ticks up your life. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Do not commit adultery. Okay. It's true. It's not a particular reason for joy. Well, in a sense, it is a reason for joy if you don't do it. But it's the spouse who is the reason for joy. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So the community of Christians is to be the sign the fragile, limited sign in which the beauty, 
the attractiveness of Christ breaks through. Let me conclude with a few words about Father Giussani. When um, we left, when my wife and I left Rome in 1984, that was just the year in which he sent, Father Giussani sent the first Italians over to the US at the request of Pope John Paul II. And my wife and I helped. I was studying at Harvard Divinity School, so the ones who were sent to Boston, I became friends with. We helped them a little bit. And in those years, Father Giussani would come pretty regularly to help get things started. And since I knew Italian, I was usually the one who translated. That was an immense grace, being near him time and time again and having an impression of him. It's difficult for me to say exactly what the impression is. I tried to describe it before as saying he seemed to me free like a bird. He seemed to be able to go where he wanted. He didn't seem oppressed by anything. He seemed natural. There was no pressure from him on me, no violence, but an immense attractiveness that came from love for God, love for Christ, having been deeply struck by Christ. I think this is why this event has, in the many years since then, slowly been verified, and I've stayed with it, remained with it, for both my wife and me, and for many of our children, it's been an education in the faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Father Solanus Benfati. I was so honored by and grateful for the invitation to speak at this event that I rearranged my schedule significantly so that I could accept it. And once I did, my next step was to call Holly with the question, why did you ask me, because there are many experts on the thought of Monsignor Giussani, and I don't consider myself among them. And there are also many members of Com Communion and Liberation, the movement he founded, and I'm not one of those either. Holly gave me various answers to my question, but if I could summarize them and put them in my own words, her answer was, because you're our friend and because you love Giussani. And I'm happy to say that both of those things are true. And my friendship with members of the movement came about as any truly good thing does, meaning anything that's truly good for you, as a surprise, as something entirely unlooked for and unexpected, as a gift, a thing given, not a thing taken, not a thing wrestled away, not a thing manipulated, or orchestrated, something given, given from an other. And that is also one of the fundamental qualities of what Monsignor Giussani calls an event. It's how Christ happened to John and Andrew, as we've heard tonight. In many respects, the day Jesus walked into the lives of John and Andrew was a day like any other day, an ordinary day. They were 
out listening with curiosity to the prophet John the Baptist, which might not sound like an ordinary day, but it is, because they were doing what we are all doing on any given day, whether they were conscious of it or not, they were looking for something. They were longing for something. Whether they realized it or not, and whether they were able to identify what it was that they were looking for, or how they would find it, or what it would look like if they ever did. And when the Baptist said, Lamb of God, and pointed his craggy finger at him, because prophets have craggy fingers, <laughs> in my estimation. <laughs> Something happened to them. Let's pay attention here. The Baptist gives them no arguments, no narrative, no explanation, no catechesis, no proof. He simply says, him. That one. And they can't help but follow him. And they spend a few hours with him, as we've heard tonight. And when they come back, Andrew goes directly to his brother Simon and says, something unexpected happened today. We found the Messiah. Which is to say we've found what we've for so long all been looking for, what we've desired. Now, this is a ludicrous thing to say. We found the Messiah. And we must not pass over this too quickly. Monsignor Giussani asks, how could the first two, John and Andrew, have been won over at once and recognize him? There's an apparent disproportion between the extremely simple way and the certainty of the two. The answer, to put it a bit in my own words, is that when this one looked at you, you felt for the first time to be yourself. And although I, I don't remember if I ever read Giussani commenting on this, I often consider Simon's response to Andrew because, like I said, this is a ludicrous thing for a fisherman to say, we found the Messiah. How would you know? I would have asked him. But pay attention because Simon doesn't. Simon looks at him and says, let's go. Why? Why? Because Simon knows Andrew, and Andrew's a different man. Something's happened to Andrew. He's become a different man. Then, one of the most bizarre conversations ever recorded takes place. This total stranger this complete stranger looks at Andrew's brother and says, Simon, who says, yes, to then hear, now you're Peter. <laughs> and Simon looks at this man, this complete stranger, and says, All right, what is that? What is that? The only possible explanation for this is that when this man looks at you, you feel to be yourself for the first time. When this one tells you your name, you know it for the first time. And it has to happen this way. Notice that coming to be oneself, to feel to be oneself, does not come about through one's own work or planning or effort or understanding. It comes about through the encounter with another. You receive the gift of yourself from another. We live in an unprecedented time when on a mass scale we feel an incredible and unnecessary burden to create ourselves, to determine ourselves, to determine our identity, to determine our own our own gender, what an incredible burden. What an incredible burden. And we've convinced ourselves that I lose my freedom when I depend on another. 
when I look to another to become myself. But at least Christians should see that that's incorrect. For it's woven into the very fabric of being itself to become oneself in relationship to another. Remember, we believe in one God who is three persons, and the Son is only the Son. Because he is always, has always been coming forth from the Father. And the Father is who he is because the Son, he's begetting the Son. It's not an imperfection to derive one's identity from another. And this is why it's beautiful and freeing and astonishingly perfect that John and Andrew begin to come to be themselves the day they look into the eyes of Jesus for the first time. Not only, it's also why it's perfect that once Andrew does so, he can now go to Simon and change his life forever. Once you begin to come to be yourself, you can give this gift to others. Monsignor Giussani, while approaching one day, an enormous assembly gathered to hear him speak was asked by a reporter, why are you here in anticipation of you like this? A loaded question for sure. Tempting him, I would think, to self-importance, self-reliance, independence, maybe. And he, without batting an eyelash, responded, remember? Perché credo quello che dico. Because I, because I believe the stuff I'm talking about. And then flashed his tremendous smile and walked in. Because I believe what I'm talking about, which is the same thing as saying, because I've met Christ and I meet him each day. It's my experience for sure. Because he had encountered Christ and looked to meet him every day, I encounter Christ every time I read Giussani's words about Christian encounter. Every time I see footage of him telling the stories of the gospel, my hair stands on end. I get goosebumps and I say one more time, that's true. When someone lives according to God's method, the way God himself chose to happen to us, he becomes a different man, and the people who meet him meet God. That's why a member of the movement could answer when I asked her one day, you knew Jusani, didn't you? This, she could answer me, know him? I don't know how to answer that, but I can tell you that he saved my life. And that's her story to tell. But I will tell you that she added, and no one looked at you like he did. And no one loved you like he did. No one was a father like he was. And I felt his preference for me. And I felt that it was for me and me alone. Until I went to his funeral and I looked around at the thousands of people there. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who was this man? Someone who met Christ, he would have answered. Someone who knew Christ, he would have answered. Because you don't have to be Luigi Giussani to, to, to generate this encounter for people. Some weeks ago, I met a young man who told me a story that astonished me. We were making small talk, and I was inquiring into his life a bit. He's a Catholic missionary serving the poor. I asked if he had gone to university. He had. Which one? He named a prestigious Ivy League school. He didn't mention what I later learned, that he went there at 16. Soon it came out in conversation that he is Jewish. Okay, so by this point, my mouth is wide open. It remains so for the rest of the conversation. I stood there with my mouth wide open, a half-eaten hot dog in one hand, my eyes bulging out of my head, staring at this young man, pleading with him, and then what, at each juncture of the story. He told me about how when he had been a boy, he was sent to a synagogue, which for him was unsatisfying because there he felt it didn't, they didn't give them content. They were merely learning superficial things like pron the pronunciation of Hebrew words. It wasn't enough for him. Over time, he becomes an intellectual atheist. Yeah? So what happened, I demanded. And he said to me, in all simplicity, at university I met someone that told me the gospel. Yeah? <laughs> then what? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, well, 
so I got baptized. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? That's it? That's the whole story? Yeah, that's the whole story. Well, what did the guy say to you? You were a bright, intellectual atheist. What did the guy possibly say to you? Why did you believe him? You know what he said to me? Because he loved me. And then I met his family, and they loved each other. And I had never seen that before, so I knew it was all true. That's how Christ happens to people. Again, when John and Andrew and the others met Jesus on day one, he did not propose catechesis to them, doctrine, information. Not yet. That's not why they clung to him. We're instantly bonded to him. Indeed, the only reason, the only reason they later believed anything he would teach them was because they were bonded to him, because they adhered to him, which happened because he loved them in a way that made them feel to be themselves. But make no mistake, after that, they would believe anything this man said. My experience as a priest in various ways confirms this method God chose. I see what happens when I propose this gospel, this way of being, this way of Christ being for you to, let's say, a penitent in the confessional. I know that for me, I can shrink back into a way of confessing my sins that's an enumeration of a list that I've worked hard to create so that I can earn the legal satisfaction that comes through the sacrament, and that's not all wrong. But what would happen if I were to approach the sacrament as if Peter, looking into the eyes of Jesus that day on the beach after he had betrayed the Lord three times, an event Jusani often spoke of, Peter's yes to the question, do you love me, in this fragile moment, where Peter feels his sinfulness like never before can only be understood if we see that before this, this man who looks at you this way and asks for your love, one becomes capable as a surprise, as a gift. One becomes capable here before this man of being one's true self, of having dignity, of loving. And I see that repeated again and again in the confessional, for example, depending on how I, the priest, approach the sacrament with my disposition and advice. I also think of a woman I worked with for a long time who was destroyed when I met her for having had abortions years earlier, lots of them. And years before I met her, the panic attacks had gotten so bad, so debilitating that she finally started seeing a psychologist and after trying everything else he could think of, he finally asked, look, you're a Christian, right? She said, yeah, I'm a practicing Catholic. He said, well, look, I'm Jewish, so I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But isn't the whole point of this Christianity business that Jesus died for your sins, to forgive your sins? <laughs> yes, she replied flatly, of course. Okay, all sins, as he tried to connect the dots for her. Yeah, all sins, she said, not making the connection. Every single one? She saw what he was getting at. Her final answer, yes, except this one. Here was a Jew trying to catechize a Catholic and doing a pretty good job. Well, he got all the facts straight, and she understood it. She understood the catechesis, she understood the point, but it had no avenue to penetrate. It had no landing place. Nowadays, she tells other post-abortive women a story of an important turning point for her in her journey toward healing. We, she and I, we're going around and around, as we had for a long time, about whether or not God had forgiven her or could 
even could forgive her, and when I insisted for the thousandth time, she, exasperated, blurted out, how do you know? How can you be so sure? And she says that I responded, because I know him. And something moved in her, and something shifted, and she determined to get to know him. And once she encountered him, then things started to move for her. It was a long journey. It was not overnight. It was a journey made up of living this method day after day, not her own work, but allowing him to show up, love her, create her, give her to her. A religious sister who had met this woman at the beginning of her journey was sitting next to me years later as the woman spoke, and the sister turned to me and whispered, she's not even the same person. She's a completely different person. And it's true. A darkness and sadness and torment lifted and was replaced by self-possession and peace, and what was needed was to encounter Jesus, whom she knew all about from years of Catholic school and honored every Sunday at Mass, but had never encountered. John Paul II, in a teaching on catechesis, once explained, in catechetical practice, the model must allow for the fact that the initial evangelization encounter has often not taken place. A certain number come for catechesis still without any explicit personal attachment to Jesus Christ. There's a book that's had a certain amount of success in recent years, Forming Intentional Disciples by Sherry Waddell. Its opening pages are quite alarming, giving statistic after statistic that all add up to an indication of just how many unevangelized people who've not encountered Christ, people to whom Christ has not happened, how many of them are sitting in the back pew of Catholic churches as an experiment, looking for something, hoping to meet something, but not finding it disappear because it isn't sustainable to live Christianity as just a bunch of doctrines. Because it isn't sustainable to live Christianity as a bunch of of doctrines. I have to know that they are doctrines that answer my real needs. Monsignor Giussani presciently saw this chapter of Christianity coming at least since the 50s, when everything to many seemed to be a golden age. Everyone was baptized, everyone went to church, everyone knew their catechism. He looked around and said, this is all doomed to fail. This is not sustainable. He was a gift given to the church precisely for this purpose, I believe. His little sister would tell a story from childhood. She recounts a day when Luigi was standing at the front door of the house, hands behind his back, in a posture that I take to be sort of surveying the world. A Franciscan came walking by. And when this friar saw this boy, he stopped dead in his tracks, and he looked him up and down, and he said, you remember? O missionario, o millionario. In other words, this one here is destined for one of two possibilities only. He's either going to end up a missionary or a millionaire. That image comes to mind when I imagine him surveying the state of Christianity in the 1950s and determining that something would have to change and God's method would have to be reintroduced. But Waddell's conclusion is absolutely correct in my experience. People are starving for something that will satisfy their real desires. As I conclude, I would like to illustrate this last point with an image that has come to mind many times since I saw it. I don't actually have the image. It's a photograph, in fact, although I am hoping that after telling the story, some of you will come out of the woodwork and get me a copy of it. You'll know who you are. It's from an exhibit at Communion and Liberation's annual event, the New York Encounter, I believe from three years ago. Um, and for any of you who were part of the Extraordinary Project in question, forgive me and correct me if I get any of the details wrong, I'm referring to what was called the Millennial Experience. At this exhibit, there was a photograph 
of several of the participants of the project, all young adult women, if memory serves. They were out having dinner or drinks in a restaurant engaged in vigorous conversation, and a young man their age is looking on with his eyes and mouth wide open, astonished. See, these millennials were discussing with urgency after the possibility, asking after the possibility of real happiness, a deep, abiding happiness that can't be taken away, isn't dependent on social media likes, isn't dependent on what they viewed to be the lie they had been told growing up that a stable career was the one thing that worked toward one wanted happiness. And their waiter, I believe it was their waiter, overheard this conversation and with his eyeballs bulging out of his head and his mouth wide open said, I've never heard anyone talk like this. I think he sat down with them. Someone will have to tell me the story later. Because they were speaking like this, asking the most important questions of the human heart and censuring a single one of them, a bystander came along and said, I think I have that question too. I want to thank my friends of the movement for asking these questions because if these questions are not asked, then the proposed answer to the questions that is Christ will never have a landing place. And Christianity will die. And with it, the possibility of happiness. Thank you both very much. Um, we have time for a couple of questions here, which I'd like to ask um, both of you. Thank you. So the first um, is a question that Father Giussani asks, and, or a statement that Father Giussani uh, makes in this book. He says that the event right, that we're speaking about tonight, the event is a supreme form of knowledge. The deepest way that we can know something is through an event. And that, in fact, we cannot even understand Christianity if the event hasn't occurred. And both of you, I think, have um, touched on it. So what does that look like for you in your own experience? Can you help us understand why is the event so essential to understand Christianity? We can fight about it. <laughs> it seems to be our human way of knowing that we live a life in which we run into people. As babies, we wake up to the presence of our parents. That's an event that awakens us to full consciousness. All through our life, that's the way of knowing that we run into things, we run into people, and are led on. For an event to become an encounter, every event is an encounter. There are transitory events, insignificant events. I hit my foot against the curb here in New York. They're a bit different than in Ave Maria, Florida. It, no, it makes little difference. It's an event, but it's not an encounter. I think um, adding to that, it's the difference between. I mean, when what did he say? It's the supreme. It's the supreme form of knowledge. It's the difference between someone tells me all about Holly Peterson. You're going to like her so much. This is how tall she is. This is what her career is. Uh, we had this conversation once about this, and these are 
interests, and I can learn a lot about her, you. Walk in the room, and then I look into your eyes, and then we have a conversation, and then it becomes more than some transitory uh, event, and I discover you of you, and that can that only happens in this in this way in this encounter, and as I said in in my words previously, this this is how Christ happens. And nothing of Christianity happens without this happening first. We're sitting here in these seats today because it happened to John and Andrew that way and not any other way. Maybe one, one point occurred to me as you were speaking, <clears throat> and it's, it's possible for us to get trapped in ourselves, in our own sadness, in our own recoiling from what's painful to us in our history. And the only thing that can free us from that self-entrapment is an event, That's true. is meeting someone who loves you for yourself. That, that struck me about Jasani. He, he, he had no project with me. He had no, no, no strategic plan. The, the Waldstein strategic plan was, did exist, and that was, that was great. So as a follow-up to both of your answers, again, I, both of you touched on this during during your talks, but because an event has to be an encounter, right? And in order for us to really know Christ, to know someone, there has to be, there has, it, it has to become an encounter. And because an event doesn't happen because I conjure it up, what can one do in order to really have an encounter? This encounter that would stir their hearts. Well, I mean this sincerely and not as a cop-out. I would like to answer the question negatively, a negative answer, which is we can begin by not manipulating things. We can begin by not orchestrating things. We can begin by letting go of our projects. Because if it's true that this thing has to happen to me, that someone else has to come along and break me out of myself, um, that can't happen if my hands are full. That can't happen if I'm too busy filling up the empty space with other things. And so once I begin to, to let go, to let the way that Jusani would call virginally, then, then Christ can happen to me in all, of, in all of the myriads of ways that are known to him. Yeah, a path of verification by experience is needed. Time is needed for a man and a woman to get to know each other and to be reasonably certain that it makes sense for them to get married to each other. They're going to be difficulties. Um, Regardless, everybody, every marriage runs into deep difficulties. It's part of human life. But this path of verification is necessary. On that path, it seems one of the most important things is to hold on to one's desire for happiness, not to give up not to fall into a kind of anorexia. There are people who starve themselves because the desire is shut off in them. Spiritually, that happens to, to many in our culture. 
So what is it that keeps desire for happiness at the core of my heart alive? And simply push a spiritual switch in me and turn on and say, now, Michael, I uh, want to be happy. There I see one of the main functions of, of, of community as I've experienced it over the years, that it is a journey of discovery that the desire for happiness is there all the time on a deep level. It's covered over by other things, but there's a labor of stripping away the things that make you, that distract you, or that make you make it seem as if the desire for happiness is futile. Beautiful. Well, thank you. I'm sorry we are out of time, but the nice segue for those of you who at School of Community is, which you just mentioned, um, there are weekly meeting that um, people who follow the movement community on the kind of our catechesis, and there is information on the, on the book table. But, um, I'd like to thank you, Mikael, for making the trip from Florida, and Father Solanas for coming from the Bronx. No. <laughs> the Bronx, there you go. So.